Welcome back to the Chris Gates Fitness Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me in this episode. I'm excited to dive in. We've got a great Q&A on tap for today. Five brand new questions submitted uh, across the internet uh, on various social media platforms. Most of these coming from Instagram, uh, some from TikTok as well. Um, wherever I am on social media at Chris Gates Fitness. If you're not following already, make sure you do follow along, but uh, we got some good ones. So let's run through the list of questions for today's episode. The first of which is uh, if I have any tips for dealing with joint pain. So we're going to dive into that, how to remedy some of those situations. Um, Question number two, why should I take an entire week off from training? That seems like a waste when I need to be training hard consistently to build muscle. So we'll dive into why uh, rest and even taking, like they said, an entire week off would be beneficial for you. Uh, question number three, this is an interesting one. When and how do I use the bathroom to get good weigh-ins? Um, we're going to dive into the specifics about, okay, if you want to lose weight and you want to step on the scale and monitor your progress over time, how do you actually have to do that? That maybe doesn't seem like it needs to be part of a and a but there's actually a lot of intricacies to weighing yourself that will either set you up for success or give you really, really bad information and potentially ruin your entire journey. So that's going to be a good one. Question number four, uh, should you still have a protein shake if you're trying to exercise to lose fat? So we talk about protein all the time uh, in terms of building muscle, right? But is it important for fat loss? We'll dive into that. And then the fifth and final question, um, I did get a few questions about the current, I guess, fat loss journey that I am on. I am uh, five weeks now at the time of recording this, five weeks into my summer cut. I am trying to shed some body fat here, and I got a question about how much cardio am I doing in my cut. So we'll dive into some of the training, uh, things I'm doing with my training program, and uh, just talk about how the cut has been going so far. So I'm excited to dive into everything really, really, really quick before we uh, dive into question number one. Just want to uh, remind you that I am a coach, and if you are interested in getting some help along the way on your journey, whether it be building muscle, burning fat, Uh, if you want to feel more confident, if you have a summer vacation coming up and you want to get fit for that, if you just generally want to feel healthier or learn the fundamental principles about how you can combine strength training, cardio, nutrition, all this type of stuff to reach your goals now and then also have a tremendous amount of baseline knowledge to manage this stuff for yourself long term in the future. Uh, That's what I do with all my clients. So if you're interested in getting uh, coaching, you can hit the coaching link that is in the show notes to this episode. Uh, It'll take you to my website, chrisgatesfitness.com, where uh, you can read more about what coaching is like, and you can read about what some of my clients uh, have been up to. I work with people all over the world to chase their fitness goals, chase chase their health goals, and I would love to talk to you if that's something you're interested in as well. So, all right, let's dive into question number one. Okay, question number one, like we said, any tips for dealing with joint pain? And you know, it's interesting, as a personal trainer, an online personal trainer, which is which is what I am, um, I get a lot of questions from people about injury prevention or injury treatment. And to be upfront and completely honest with you from the start of answering this question, I can give you some general recommendations that could help you with whatever joint pain you're experiencing. If it's like shoulder, knee, those are some of the common ones. But um, these questions are much more effectively answered by an actual physical therapist or doctor. So if you have joint pain that you're concerned about and you're wondering, okay, is this a problem and how do I remedy this situation? You're probably best to start by talking to your doctor and seeing if they think that you need professional treatment, okay? And now I understand that sometimes there's just some nagging joint pain that is you know, not necessarily serious. And then there is joint pain that could potentially be serious. But again, a doctor can help you figure out if one, if it is one or the other, right? If it is serious or not serious. So I get questions about injuries all the time. And I, in every one of my answers, I do try to give some, you know, general feedback, but I also make sure to say like, you should consult a doctor if this is something that you're particularly concerned about. Um, now, From a training perspective and just from experience of years of working with people, I do know that like there are some exercises that can cause pain 
that don't necessarily mean you have a specific injury or problem. You may just not be put together in a way that makes that exercise effective for you. Uh, We are all different sizes and shapes and we all, all have different limb lengths and our joints are, you know, the same, but also slightly different. There are little intricacies about each and every one of us that makes us different from each other. And it also makes a training program that that's why training programs should be personalized. That's why I don't give a template to any of my clients. That's why we work specifically on what's going to work best for you because um, what works good for me or another one of my clients may not work well for you based on the way that you're put together. So um, I would say, you know, if you run into an exercise that potentially causes you pain uh, in a joint, I would say first and foremost, see if you can do a different variation of that exercise to see if it's more comfortable. So like if you're doing a incline chest press as an example, and cause that's one that uh, honestly causes a lot of people shoulder discomfort. Um, and for, even for me, like I like doing them on some weeks, it'll make my shoulder feel awful. And on other weeks, my shoulder will feel great. No problems. So there are opportunities to, if you're training a specific muscle group and the exercise you're doing causes pain, you could find a different exercise variation to still train that muscle group and potentially a different variation will not cause you any pain. And then you can move forward with that. And if those types of situations happen and you see that result where like, okay, I can't do the incline chest press, but I can do a flat press and that feels great. Well, if that's you, if that's the situation, then you can just continue moving forward. And I would say that, okay, you probably don't have like an injury that needs treated. You just need to choose exercises that are going to work best for you. Um, But on the flip side of that, if you are trying to train a muscle group and literally everything hurts, or if like you're trying to train upper body and your shoulder is giving you pain, throughout entire workouts for every type of exercise you do, or if you keep every time you train chest, whether it's an incline press or a flat press or a cable fly or a dumbbell fly, you know, any type of exercise that you try, if they all cause you pain, then that's your body giving you a sign and telling you something. And and that would be the situation where I would say, okay, yeah, let's go, let's talk to a doctor and see what's going on here. See if they have a professional recommendation on how I can get this looked at, get it treated. Um, because if everything's causing you pain, (laughs) there's really no other option. You shouldn't be forcing yourself through training sessions where you're, you're continuing to cause that area to be aggravated. So those are the two recommendations I would give you. Uh, Honestly, most of the time, what I find is that there are just certain exercises that cause people problems and that's okay. And you just will shy away from those exercises. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. Um, We just need to do some other things that are going to be more effective for you. Question number two, why should I take an entire week off from training? This seems like a waste when I need to be training hard to build muscle. I got this question on uh, TikTok and it's an interesting one. And this is kind of a attitude that I think permeates the, the segment of lifters that are really interested in building strength and building muscle. And that is all they want to do. That's their primary goal. That's what they are focused on. And like, there is a lot of truth to the fact that you need to be training hard consistently over a long period of time to build strength and build muscle and optimize the amount of progress that you can make. So whenever I post things about taking a week off, taking to one to two to three rest days a week, taking deload weeks. Uh, I, I almost always get responses like this one that say, why the hell should I do that? And, um, I even got another one on this, the post that this one came from, uh, somebody said like, take a take a break from the gains. No, sir. Not going to do that. Thanks. Uh, anyway. Um, and it's funny, you know, cause like, I think there is some humor to that, but in reality, if you're not giving yourself rest and not allowing your body to recover, I don't care how much more progress you think you are making or think you will make by just continuing to go to the gym and not taking weeks off or days off from training. 
I don't care what you think. It's not, it's not going to work out long-term for you. Um, at the very least, you will plateau. You will absolutely plateau if you're legitimately training hard. If you're going into the gym and you're going through the motions and you know not, not really challenging yourself, you could lift every day forever, and it's not going to make a difference because you're not training hard. But if you're getting in there, you're getting after it, you're training hard, you're going to need to give yourself rest. Your body accumulates fatigue, and some of it you notice – and some of it you don't notice. Um, the most noticeable fatigue that we, I think, are all common with is muscle soreness, right? You, you lift really heavy or you let, have a very intense training session, go to sleep, wake up the next day, and you have that, that soreness from the training session the day before. That's called DOMS, which stands for Delayed Onset Muscle Soreness. Um, and it's a, it, it can be an indicator of the fact that you trained uh, quite hard. So that's that's you know the type of fatigue that we we notice. And other types of fatigue you may notice is just feeling more sluggish, feeling more tired, uh, feeling more drained. Um, but you build up fatigue in your muscles, your bones, your joints, your central nervous system uh, within your body that you you also don't notice. Um, and you don't notice it unless you're paying very, very close attention to all of the details that go along with your training. And again, you know, that's something that a coach can do for you where, you know, you see if like things start to plateau, if you continue to train hard and you see like week to week, you're making progress for a while and then that progress stops, but you just keep lifting, you keep trying all the same things and (laughs) you keep hitting the same numbers and your performance doesn't increase. Um, that's, that's, that's a sign that like, okay, we need to take a step back. We need to take an entire week off from training or at least a deload week to allow your body to catch up because your body uh, can only recover from so much. And if you continue throwing a ton of work at it, a ton of training at it, um, you're going to run into a point. Again, if you're training legitimately hard, you're going to run into a point where your body just simply can't keep up with the recovery demands of your strength training program. So why should I take an entire week off from training? It is to do just that. Give your body an opportunity to catch up to the recovery demands of your strength training program. This is really, really important. And I can explain to you how I do it with most of my clients because um, what we will do is take a deload week, which is not necessarily a week off from training, but it is a week that is more better described as like active recovery, what we will do is continue training because it's important to continue exercising those muscle groups and working in those motor patterns that we have going on, but like pulling back on the intensity significantly. So that could mean pulling some sets out of your routine for a week. So you're doing fewer total sets for each muscle group. Uh, could even mean reducing some of the rep ranges. And it, it almost always involves pulling some of the weight off too. So, you know, if you're uh, squatting, I don't know, 275, and then we go into a deload week, you're probably not going to be squatting anywhere close to 275. We might be doing 225 for a week um, to... Can, again, continue to work in that motor pattern, train those muscle groups, but also give your body an opportun- opportunity to catch up to the recovery demands of your training. Um, it's really, really important. And then what typically happens when you come out of that deload week is you're not going to just jump back into squatting 275. We're going to take a step back to eventually be able to take multiple steps forward. And without a deload week in there, without a recovery week, whatever you want to call it, week off from training, you will you you will not be able to just continue to take steps forward. Taking one step back to take two, three, four steps forward in the next training block is exponentially better than taking like one, two, three steps forward and then being stuck on that third step for the next three months. That doesn't make any sense. Um, And whether you want to believe it or not, your body needs that opportunity. So why should you take an entire week off from training? Like I said, it's to to give your body an opportunity to catch up. It it really is. And if you don't, you will eventually plateau. Um, There are worse things that could happen. You could... um, I mean, you could get injured, obviously, and then, you know, depending on how hard you're training, you could also just run your body down so much that, uh, you know, you could find yourself getting sick. Central nervous system fatigue is a very serious thing. It doesn't happen to a lot of lifters, but it can, um, and you're just much better off 
giving yourself that time to rest. And I completely understand with not wanting to take it because that was me. I think this, this attitude is more in younger lifters, to be honest with you. I think it's more in younger lifters because you're so motivated to do it. Since you are younger, you have so much more energy um, and you're just ready to get in the gym and just keep training, training, training. And when you get started with lifting as a younger lifter, you see progress pretty quickly. So then you're just like, well, if some is good, more is better. We got to keep going to the gym. We got to keep lifting. And I was there. I was there. And and honestly, um, past my like newbie gains phase of lifting, I continued to do it. (laughs) I continued to forget about deload weeks. And I just trained, 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 and thought it was the right thing to do. And looking back, I, I wasted a lot of my younger years not taking advantage of the gains that I could have made because I decided to just let my ego take over. So don't let your ego take over. Take those rest weeks. Take those deload weeks. Make sure you're also giving yourself one to two rest days uh, a week within a training block because that's going to let that training block be longer and allow you to consistently train for longer. Most of the training blocks I have with my clients are like four to eight weeks. Um, Most of them end up being six, seven, eight weeks, which is a pretty long training block, but that's because I don't think right now I have a single client training more than five days a week because it just doesn't make sense. If you can have one to two rest days, and in this case, two rest days or more a week, two to three is what most of my clients have. That's going to allow you to have more recovery within the week and then allow you to be more fresh and recovered for each training session that you have so then we can train longer and we can train really hard. It just makes way more sense to take the rest and uh, I hope that that answered the question uh, sufficiently. Question number three is when and how do I use the bathroom to get good weigh-ins? And this is a great question. It's somebody thinking about the details. This one also came through on TikTok. Uh, The details of weighing yourself and making sure that you're getting good data is important if you're trying to lose weight. I reference weigh-ins with my clients as data, and you can have a bucket of good data or you can have a bucket of bad data, depending on how you go about the process. A bucket of bad data would be just weighing yourself whenever you feel like it on a daily basis or uh, by you know every other day basis um, throughout the day, and that's stupid. It's not going to set you up for success because those weigh-ins have no relation to each other if you think about it. Like if you weigh yourself one day in the morning, and then the next day you weigh yourself, you know, after uh, you use the, you, you go to the gym at lunch, another day you forget and you weigh yourself before bed, like the amount of food and liquids that are in your system at that point in time is different each day. So those weigh-ins are not going to be able to be considered relative to each other. And that means you have a bucket of bad data. Now, a bucket of good data would look like every morning I wake up, I use the bathroom, I step on the scale because, you know, there's only so much you can control, but you can at least control that. So whether or not the day before was a success or a failure, but depending on how you, you know, view it, you know, if, if you, even if you overate the day before or, or however things went with your nutrition plan, if you're waking up the next day, using the bathroom, stepping on the scale, and logging that way in, it is going to be relative relative to every other day because you're doing that every time you step on the scale. So that's how I recommend you use the bathroom to get good weigh-ins is it's just the first thing you do in the morning. You wake up, use the bathroom. In terms of using the bathroom, however you use the bathroom when you wake up, that's what you should do. Normally people wake up, you urinate, and then you can step on the scale. Um, And that is going to give you as accurate of weigh-ins day to day to day as you possibly can get. Now, that doesn't mean that the progress is going to be linear in one direction or the other. Uh, You're still going to have the fluctuations. You're still going to have all the normal things that happen when you're trying to lose weight where your body weight goes up and down and up and down. But if you have, ideally, you want to have a downward trend trend over time. But that is how I would recommend you use the bathroom to get good weigh-ins. With my clients, I give them a manual when we start working together that has a bunch of different body composition things that we're going to track over time. And one of them is how to do weigh-ins. And I actually have an article on my website. If you want to look it up, Chris Gates Fitness. If you Google Chris Gates Fitness, uh, how to track your body weight, you should find an article that walks you through a lot of the details on how to properly do this. 
Question number four, should you still have a protein shake if you're trying to exercise to lose fat? This is a really good question. And the answer is kind of, it depends. Now let's talk about protein shakes first, because protein shakes are just like every other fitness supplement where you're, there is no need to take it necessarily, unless You know, there are some vitamins and minerals and supplements like that where if it's like you have a deficiency and you've been told by a doctor that you need to take it, then that would be considered a need. But, you know, the fitness supplements where it's like whey protein powder, pre-workouts, creatine, uh, beta alanine, you know, like stuff like that, none of those are needs, okay? Nobody needs to take them. So um, do you need to take a protein shake in any situation? No. Um, It does depend though, I think basically about how you manage your diet within your weight loss plan. Uh, Protein shakes are going to be beneficial for fat loss if you struggle to hit your daily protein. And having adequate protein while you're losing weight, uh, especially this question was to lose fat. If you're trying to lose body fat, having protein shakes can be beneficial within a weight loss program Because, you know, if you're strength training, you're doing cardio, you're doing all this exercise and and you're in a calorie deficit, um, when you're in a calorie deficit, your body is searching within itself to find essentially tissue that it can convert into energy. So tissue could be body fat, which is primarily what people try to lose, but it could also be other tissues in the body like muscle. Now, if you're getting adequate protein in your diet on a daily basis consistently, um, that's going to help your body do as much as it possibly can to hold on to that muscle mass that you have. And, and again, I think if you're trying to exercise to lose fat, you're trying to lose specifically body fat. Um, so having adequate protein every day is very important. I'm a big proponent of a high protein diet and that that's what I work with my clients on. Um, so if you're able to get enough protein from the food that you eat in your diet, let's say, I'll just use my measurements as a, you know, uh, an example. So I'm trying to get 190 grams of protein a day. Now, if I struggle to get 190 grams of protein from physical food, having a protein shake can help me just get a quick high amount of protein into my system and supplement all of the other food that I'm eating. Again, okay, this is a supplement. Uh, So I do uh, tend to have a protein shake and I am in a fat loss phase right now. I do tend to have one protein shake a day with my breakfast uh, to help me get a big Uh, bolus of protein to start the day, a high amount of protein in my breakfast. And uh, it just starts me off on the right foot. It makes hitting my protein the rest of the day easier because I'm going to get around 50 grams. I have that protein shake with some other food that has protein in it. Uh, So I get about 50 grams in that first meal and then it makes the rest of the day uh, a bit easier to get more protein in. So if you struggle to get enough protein in, whatever your goal number is and however your diet plays out throughout the day, then I would recommend you probably could look to have a protein shake to supplement your diet and make sure you're getting in enough protein um, because that will, again, especially if you're strength training, that will help you hold on to as much muscle mass as you possibly can. And then by nature of that, and again, I I will stress that if you are strength training, by nature of that, your body is probably going to prioritize your muscle mass and then that will switch to losing more weight from specifically body fat that's typically how it occurs okay um and so you know strength training is a crucial piece to this puzzle if you want to lose specifically body fat and again i think that's what most people are trying to do you should be strength training it's going to help you lose more weight from specifically body fat um But otherwise, if you get enough protein from food and and you don't need to supplement with a shake, you do not have to. One last thing I'll mention is that shakes um, have actually been found to help with the feeling of fullness after individual meals. And so if you think about that, like if you have a protein shake before you eat a meal, that protein shake gets in your system, you get a bunch of protein in your system, and then you eat food, you're typically going to feel fuller a bit quicker, um, or you could even have a meal down a protein shake right after it, um, and it can potentially help 
increase your level of fullness. If you feel more full after the meals that you eat, that would mean that you're more satisfied on a low amount of calories. That could help you adhere to your diet more consistently for a long period of time. So that's also a potential benefit of it. But really with protein, with protein shakes and a fat loss program, we're talking about giving your body what it needs from a recovery standpoint to allow you to hold on to as much muscle mass as possible while losing as much body fat as possible. And that just comes down to hitting your daily protein, whatever that number is. Shakes can help you get there if you struggle to get that daily protein in with just the food that you're eating. All right, last question of the podcast is about me. So <laughs> let's dive into it. Question number five, how much cardio are you doing in your cut? Uh, and I'll start off by saying this has been the most, I'm five weeks into my cut right now. This has been the most successful five weeks of any cut that I've ever done. I have done several cuts in the past. Um, my goal is primarily like long-term health and building as much muscle and strength as I possibly can. And by nature of that, I spend most of the time, uh, we're talking nine to 10 months a year in a slight calorie surplus or maintenance. So I am typically trying to slowly gain weight throughout the majority of the year. And then I will spend two to three months cutting weight to lose body fat and It goes back to what we just talked about. I try to maintain as much muscle and strength as I possibly can throughout that fat loss process so that I can get back to building muscle and strength again and hopefully not lose much if any of the progress that I had made. So that's what I'm doing for, that's the goal of this cut right now is to just shed as much excess body fat as I can so that I can get back to building more muscle and strength. Um, And I have actually, in terms of how much cardio am I doing in my cut, I have no planned cardio sessions in my cut. And five weeks in, I have lost uh, 10 pounds of body fat. So I have lost 10 pounds of body fat in five weeks and I have done no planned cardio sessions at all. And I think this is part of what has made it so sustainable because in the past, I often did plan cardio sessions for myself. And if I'm being honest with you, like, If you compare cardio to lifting weights, I love lifting weights. And cardio, I am very meh on. I'm just, uh, which is weird because I was a runner growing up, but I'm just not into it anymore. So what I have done for this cut, and again, I'm, I've been, this year I have been working with a coach, uh, which has helped me tremendously to just be able to balance my own coaching business and life and uh, also have structured training. Um, we decided on just setting a step count goal every day. And I've loved, I've absolutely loved it. My, my, cardio goal, if you want to call it cardio, is just to hit at least 8,000 steps a day. And what I've loved about this is it's just, it's helped me think about moving more consistently throughout the day. And I think that that's such a stark contrast to what I've done in the past, because I think in the past I've done regular cardio sessions, but then outside of either the regular cardio sessions or my lifting routine, I've done nothing. I've just in the past, just sat on the couch, you know, like considered it like, Hey, I, my work is done here and not really tried to be very active in any other facets of life. Whereas now, um, I'm going on several short walks a day. We have the kids. So we're always looking for opportunities to be active as a family, which supports this goal, helps me get my 8,000 steps a day or more. And like this morning, I'm recording this uh, around lunchtime on a Saturday. This morning, we went to the zoo and I got 6,000 steps in to start the day. Like that's easy. It doesn't take away from my family or my life or anything like that. And uh, I've prioritized activity throughout the day. And and I, I think by nature of having it just be a step count goal, it has made my cardio less intense. It has made it less draining on me. Since it has been less intense and less draining, I think I have been able to perform better in my strength training uh, routine, my strength training program that has allowed me to hold on to more muscle and strength so far through five weeks, burn more 
body fat, we've just talked a lot about how that works, right? Strength training leads to prioritizing muscle and burning more weight, losing more weight from body fat. I think I've lost more weight from body fat so far. I think all of the 10 pounds I've lost so far are strictly body fat because my training performance has maintained itself. I haven't seen any uh, significant dips in training performance uh, and I feel really energized and feel really good. So it's gone great, and um, I appreciate the the question about how much cardio I'm doing. But like, hopefully, you know, for you listening, that maybe opens your eyes and your ears to different ways that you can go about this stuff. Uh, I I also like with with a I don't know I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I, like with a, probably more clients than than not we're doing step count goals and like, well, I have a lot of clients doing like zone two cardio and stuff like that too. But for the most part, we are trying to be active throughout the day, every day. This, this, over this past year, I've changed my, my thinking on cardio and, and, and activity within a training program so much, just learning more about zone two cardio. Um, if you haven't listened to the episode, I had Jordan, Jordan side on the podcast a few months ago, we talked about zone two cardio and I thought that was really impactful and it's essentially a low intensity form of cardio. But then there's been a, a bunch of research and I've even written about it on my website about, I mean, how, how researchers are seeing a very tight, strong correlation between daily steps and essentially longevity. So like the more steps you walk a day over time and it, it, it needs to be consistently, but if you can consistently hit more steps, the more and more steps you take, the lower risk you have of dying. And it's, it's very powerful data. And if you go into some of these research studies, it'll even show like the, the, uh, how do I want to say this? The association between walking and lifespan walking has a higher, uh, walking is a higher indicator of a long lifespan than smoking is on you dying, (laughs) which is crazy. If that makes sense, like walking is more powerful for good health than smoking is for bad health. Wrap your mind around that for a second. So uh, I've really changed my, my mind and my philosophy in terms of coaching and, and in terms of my own personal health to just like not focusing so much on like, oh, well, if I can't do hill sprints, then what am I doing? Or if I can't, you know, if I'm not doing uh, these interval workouts, I'm not going to be burning fat. Or if I'm not, you know, slaving away on the stair stepper, then I'm not doing this right. And it's like, that. screw that. Like that, none of that stuff matters. It's about increasing your daily activity um, so that you can, I don't know, be healthier. (laughs) That seems pretty important. So Um, I have not done a single planned cardio session. Occasionally I'll go for a run. Uh, but even at that, I haven't been running a bunch lately. Uh, it's mostly just been moving around, walking, doing the things that, uh, promote good health and are as sustainable as possible. So, uh, I've really enjoyed it so far, but no planned cardio. I've lost 10 pounds so far and, uh, it's been really sustainable, which has been great. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate you tuning in for this episode of the podcast. As always, I will check back in with you next week with a brand new one. Uh, in the meantime, like I said, at the start, if you're interested in coaching, uh, f- on your, uh, on your end to get healthier, build muscle, burn fat, do whatever you are interested in doing with fitness and nutrition. And you would like some help along the way. That's what I do coaching link is in the show notes. But uh, until next time, thank you again so much for listening and I will talk to you soon.